So today I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a, uh, I think we have about 45 minutes, I'm going to give a quick 30 minute overview of what's going on um, at the federal um, level related to uh, people with intellectual and other disabilities. So what's happening right now um, in, in Congress? Right now, Congress is on recess, as you know. They went home to, um, uh, to prepare for the midterm elections that uh, take place on no November 4th. Um, but they left without finishing very important work like appropriations, our federal funding. There's 12 appropriations bills that and none of them have been signed into law, so they um, they, they decided to come back um, after the election um, in what they, we call a lame duck um, Congress. That is, uh, some of those members will have been voted out of office, but they still come back in for this special post-election um, session. Um, so it's kind of a strange, um, a, a strange practice. Um, and they don't usually do a whole lot in a lame duck for that reason. They don't want to make big decisions with unelected leaders. Um, but they do have to work on appropriations. There's a couple of uh, 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 disability-related um, laws that we're hoping that they still finish up. Um, one of them is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, another one that has a, a real possibility is the ABLE Act, and I'll talk more about those um, in a little bit. So first of all, what's going on with our U.S. fiscal policy? Um, it, it's kind of a mess right now because they're just since for a long time have not um, really done our budget and appropriations in what we call a regular order, that is developing an overall budget, the president introducing a budget, and then the appropriations committees working on the 12 annual appropriations bills. It just, with our um, very partisan, divided Congress, it has not worked out that way in a long time. Instead. Um, we have been working under various different um, uh, overall laws that are kind of keeping our discretionary programs um, capped. Um, so mainly they're working on trying to reduce the deficit and debt, and debt, and that's been like the major focus. Um, so it, it's dealing with major budget battles that you've heard of, the government shutdown. They've talked about that because last time we were here last year, the government wasn't shut down. Um, near default on our and um, on our debt and sequestration, all while we were trying to recover from a, a recession, um, and, there, and we have a real crisis in economic growth, um, jobs, and household income. Um, so we have actually, with some of these uh, measures, um, reduced the deficit um, by over four trillion um, since 2010. Um, the problem is uh, the way it's been done, and most of it has been done, um, most of the spending cuts have come from uh, discretionary programs, um, programs that uh, have annual appropriations from year to year. Um, so the, that very little piece of the discretionary pie that, um, that are non-entitlement programs um, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, that, that includes things like special education, supported employment, um, a lot of our research dollars, higher education, a lot of the programs that we feel like really need more investment, the pie for that is getting smaller and smaller and it's making it harder for any of us to um, in, invest in new innovative ideas in, in, in helping the population that we really care about. Um, so um, where we are is really our non-defense discretionary spending is actually um, at the lowest historical levels that it's ever um, been and, and as I said the result is no money to make um, new investments and so when people say to me well we really need to do this we really you know we really need to reauthorize IDEA and put more money into this and I'm like yeah but we're in this like zero-sum game that if we if we make an investment here we have to cut from here um, we call them pay-fors, so if there's any kind of new investment in a program, they have to find some other place to cut, usually in the same kind of category. Um, we're dealing right with that right now with the ABLE Act, um, the, uh, which, which I'll talk more about, but it's kind of stuck even with a lot of bipartisan support because we can't find the money to pay for it. So um, what's going to happen in the lame duck? Well, they have to do the, um, they have to finish 
this past year, this past fiscal year's appropriations, which actually started on October 1. Um, so the, when they come back, the big question is, will they actually do um, a big omnibus and wrap up the 12 annual appropriations bill into one bill and pass it? That's what we'd like to happen. Um, because then they can actually make some policy changes within it and, and actually increase some places and cut other places. Um, what's, what I think is more likely um, is a three-month continuing resolution. We're actually under a continuing resolution right now, uh, which just keeps all of our programs at basically level funding, except for some anomalies. Um, so they'll either consider uh, a full year continuing resolution to, to cover the entire year or a three-month extension just to get us into the new Congress, which come, will come in then in January, and then they'll uh, either do an omnibus then or, again, a full year continuing res resolution. Sometimes a continuing resolution comes with a cut, um, an across-the-board cut. Um, uh, we're hoping that they stick with what we're calling the the Ryan Murray uh, budget deal from the previous fiscal year, which restored some of the sequestration cuts that we got in 2011, um, and do a full year continuing resolution using that number. Um, uh, and then they're, con they're considering um, further tax cuts, which would actually eat in again to our discretionary spending. Um, so we are watching very closely all of these big picture budget items as well as each individual appropriations bill. Um, and then we're very worried about the budget um, uh, for the next fiscal year, which, that, which should be getting, they're beginning to work on right now, um, except that it usually starts with the president putting together a budget, but the president's, the administration doesn't even have the numbers from the previous year, so it's very difficult to begin the budget planning for the next year when you don't have the final numbers from the previous year. Nonetheless, they're trying to think about what it might look like, and they are putting together um, budgets. But um, it all depends on the makeup of the new Congress. Uh, as, ever, as you probably were reading in the papers, um, you know, the, the House is um, in the majority of the, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats um, uh, are in the majority in the Senate right now. That might change in this election, um, in which case um, that could change the, the budget outlook. If the Republicans have the majority of the Senate, we might be looking at major reconciliation bills with big changes to the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Um, we, are, we, are, um, we disability advocates are, are very concerned about the impact of some of these big decisions, big budget decisions um, on programs that impact people with disabilities. So overall, our biggest our message is to um, urge regular order, um, to go back to the process of actually looking at, it, at all the programs. We used to testify in Congress and talk about our programs. Um, we'd like to go back to that process where they actually look thoughtfully at where we should be spending our federal dollars. Um, and, and then um, uh, everybody agrees that we need to have a... Um, um, to, you know, get a hold of our debt and our deficit, but we should do it in a very thoughtful and, and balanced approach, and we should consider including revenues um, as well as just cuts. Um, so real quickly, um, that I, I mentioned the ABLE Act. It's, uh, that stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. Um, they like to make up these nice little names to help people remember um, uh, the bills. Um, and this has a um, very strong bipartisan, bicameral um, uh, um, support, um, actually uh, over 400 bipartisan co-sponsors now. Um, it would create a, a, a new Section 529 within the Internal Revenue Code, just like the, the traditional <coughs> college tuition savings programs, to make it easier for families um, and individuals with disabilities to um, save assets for disability-related expenses, education, very flexible education, um, making modifications on a home, <coughs> transportation, and so forth. It's something that we think is um, really needed, and we've convinced a lot of people that, it, that it's needed. So even though there's this much bipartisan support, um, we were hoping that it would be 
the cost would be decibel dust in a larger tax bill that would be moving, and we never got such a tax bill because really nothing is moving in Congress right now. It's, it's quite dysfunctional, um, to be honest. Um, so because we don't have the big tax bill, the, um, the Congressional Budget Office scored it at a very high number, um, $20 billion to be exact or thereabouts, and um, we can't find $20 billion in pay-fors in a place to cut to pay for that. So they've made changes to the program to bring it down to uh, two billion cost. And now we, that means it's major changes and not everybody's happy with them, uh, all the changes. So we're negotiating on all that and trying to, it'll be a compromise bill and it'll be a smaller program. It won't be everything that we wanted, but we're still hoping that we get something in this Congress before um, it adjourns finally. Um, and then the Disability Treaty. This is uh, an international uh, human, equal rights, human rights treaty for people with disabilities that would help the one billion people worldwide um, and, and set up you know, basic principles that were based on the Americans with Disabilities Act and we could export some of the things that we've learned um, globally and it would allow us to be on the, an international committee that is helping to um, uh, basically provide technical assistance, um, share information. Um, it would be really helpful globally for business. Um, we've been trying really hard to convince um, the Senate to, uh, to ratify the treaty, but it, it's been very difficult um, for reasons other than support for dis people with disabilities. It's, it's more ideological uh, reasons against um, the United Nations. I mean, simply put, there's a lot of uh, people skeptical of anything that has UN's, the UN's name on it. So we've had a very difficult time overcoming um, what we think are some unreasonable fears uh, about this very simple um, equal rights treaty. So, but we're, we don't give up. We keep trying, and, and we've been working really hard. Um, we're getting close. Um, we think that we, if we, we, if we put it to a vote tomorrow, that we are very close. We we need a, at least six more Republicans just to say yes to this treaty. Um, uh, and we think we're close, but nobody will admit it publicly. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying to pressure um, the Senate to take action on it in the lame duck um, because we think we are close. And we don't think that we'll have a very good chance after Senator Harkin retires and other disability champions retire um, we think this is kind of like our last chance, so we really want to put to a vote even if we're close, even if we're not positive we have the 67 needed. So that's where we are in the, um, in the lame duck. Any questions? Okay, so... That's just symbolic, though. You know, do we really care? Um, yeah, we do care. It's really important. Well, first of all, it... it um, you know, I, I travel, did some traveling around the world, and it's embarrassing that we helped to create the treaty, um, we signed the treaty, and now we can't, we, we, we can't get the support to sign on. So it's kind of embarrassing that we're not at the lead of this, that we should be um, leading in the world on this important issue. And um, it would help us be, like I said, uh, be part of this uh, international committee um, and other people, other countries have even said that they're going to, uh, they're, they're going to do business with countries that have signed the treaty. We've even heard that. So it's, it's not good even for us in global business sense. We should be thinking about technology, for example, and all have the same standards of technology, but we're not even part of the conversation um, if we're not on that committee. So it, it's just, it's kind of embarrassing um, yeah, for one. How many Republicans voted now? In 2012, um, all, almost all but five. That's pretty embarrassing. It's embarrassing, yeah. So we, um, that's why I said, it's, we have all the Democrats, all the Democratic senators on board. We need at least six more Republicans in order to get the 67 votes needed to ratify. Um, so any other questions? Good questions. Um, so it, we, we did have some accomplishments um, in this Congress and the administration. Um, 
we consider public policy not just legislation but also regulations and other administrative actions. Um, uh, so we were successful in getting the Workforce Innovations and Opportunity Act um, passed. Um, the uh, reauthorization of the, of the Combating Autism Act, which is now called Autism Cares Act. Um, the administration um, is, make, is updating out-of-date uh, out um, regulations related to discrimination and accessibility uh, within the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and the administration issued um, a, a new regulation in May re uh, related to Medicaid home and community-based waivers to make sure that they are, um, they really are community-based. Um, and then we've been, uh, the administration has been working very hard on um, implementing the uh, Affordable Care Act, even though there's been many barriers um, and challenges related to that. Um, so first, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, really quickly, um, president, the president signed it into law in July, um, and this was a, a significant success because the House of Representatives had, had a bill that would have consolidated and, and, and cut a lot of programs that we care about, um, and the, but they really wanted a jobs bill, and that's how we got a bipartisan, bicameral bill through the, the Congress. The, the, the staff on the, the House and Senate worked behind the scenes to, um, to make compromises, and, but it was mostly the Senate bill that got passed. Um, but it is a compromise, and, and nothing, nothing will get through this kind of Congress, this Congress with, without strong bipartisanship, bipartisan support. Um, so it reauthorizes the Workforce Investment Act, which includes um, the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and there's many improvements within this, this law um, for people with disabilities to, to gain um, and retain competitive integrated employment. And throughout there are updates on uh, existing language related to assistive technology, which we now just say technology. That's it. That's what I was talking. That's what I'm talking. That may alter the location in which each CBS services can be provided. What it does is, um, I'll, I'll talk more about it soon, if, if you don't mind. Um, I'll get to that. Okay, because it's very, it is very important. Um, so, but real quickly, the, the Workforce Investment Act reauthorization. Um, there are changes throughout um, the the new law that focuses on competitive integrated employment for, for uh, people with disabilities, especially on youth. There was a lot of discussion about um, getting rid of 14C, which is subminimum wage. Um, there was not there was not bipartisan, bicameral, or even disability community agreement on 14C. So instead, Senator, as with Senator Harkin taking the lead, there was just a uh, focus on um, uh, creating more opportunities for competitive employment and also kind of cutting off the uh, front door of sub-minimum wage settings and making sure that youth with disabilities, um, as, they're come, as they're transitioning out of high school, um, are afforded more opportunities for um, while they're still in school to try um, working while they're in high school. Same kind of opportunities that people, with, students without disabilities um, have so that they can make better and more informed choices as they're exiting high school. And so, um, there are, VR has to provide more funding. There's, there's no, not, like I said, there's not more funding for anything. Um, but there it does direct VR to provide more funds for transition services. Um, uh, and um, um, there's language in there to try to make sure that VR counselors get more um, training. Um, there's more uh, looking at quality. There's more looking at wage and hour rules. There's more oversight. There's more reporting requirements and data. data. Uh, collection requirements, everything they, they can do without more money. So are you talking about pay, the amount of money they're paying people to go to work? 
I'm talking about uh, creating opportunities within an existing law so that um, the kids, students with disabilities that are coming out should be, a, first of all, assumed that um, they're employable, um, assume that they're qualified for vocational rehabilitation. Um, they're, they're, they can't just go right into a, a subminimum wage setting anymore without at least try, getting VR services, without at least trying um, competitive integrated employment, without trying internships and um, other job opportunities, uh, mentoring and, and things like that that other kids um, get. But no, there's no more money. Um, it's just creating higher expectations for kids from the time they're born. I mean, that's really where we're kind of heading is trying to uh, make sure that youth, as they go through school, um, that their families get different messages when they're born, that the schools are providing different messages about the expectations for these kids, um, and that um, schools I mean, schools can no longer just contract with um, a shelter workshop so that kids have a pipeline right into shelter workshop that's just not going to be allowed anymore. And it's not just the Workforce Investment Act that that's happening, that's, um, that's happening with oversight from the Department of Justice and Department of Labor. Um, so it's a whole movement, it's an employment first movement. What if the student's not employed? The assumption is employment first. Everybody should have choices, but they should be um, where that fits their abilities and choices and wishes and um, what they want, but they should at least have the opportunities. People are very concerned that there's this huge move to get rid of shelter workshops, and so what's going to happen is yeah. students will maybe work four hours one day a week, and then they'll live done work. And, and can, you, can you identify yourself? From Kansas. 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 Okay. Thanks, Patty. Um, I mean, I've got this list of um, yeah. concerns from Kansas. Yeah. And, and shelter work, trying to get rid of yeah. sheltered workshops is one. Another is uh, mm -hmm. talking about paying people that work in a work situation, mm -hmm. disabled people that work in a work situation more. Well, that's ridiculous because you just pay it back mm -hmm. to the state. Well, what the workforce. Um, the, what the WIOA, as we like to call it, does is just make sure that um, students with disabilities are getting the same opportunities that other kids get. There, a, a lot of the studies that, um, and research that, that we've seen out there are showing that um, students that at least get to try different work environments and try, get to do internships, get you know, on the site, uh, you know, same kind of opportunities that we did when we, were, when we were young and we got to try out different job opportunities, um, students with disabilities, we want to make sure that they're getting the same opportunities. That's all that this, the Workforce Investment Act reauthorization law does. Um, it doesn't touch, it doesn't say close shelter workshops or anything else like that. It just says, let's try to do our best to give kids more opportunities. Um, I may be jumping ahead, but um, I'm Julie Ferrer and I'm the policy analyst for the Developmental Disabilities Council here. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about the Department of Justice um, findings around sheltered workshops related to Olmstead and then also, um, and maybe you can, but also um, how the HCDS community-based settings that that's being interpreted in some cases to affect um, uh, segregated um, or um, right uh, in relation to employment yes okay because I think maybe that might help a little bit to understand those mm -hmm. other perspectives and how they're looking at it as well I don't know but I guess the way I I see it is there's just a place, big definitely. overall <laughs> movement to to make sure that um, it, it what we call employment first meaning um, that employment should be uh, a first, first opportunity for, for people that we should assume that uh, someone is employable and if they want to. Um, and, and so it's the Department of Labor, the Department of Justice, in Congress, um, and um, in the states, in the communities, everybody trying to move the needle 
um, on helping um, employment of people with disabilities because um, the employment rate is still so low and it stays low and, and the economy right now has not helped. It's making it even <coughs> harder. Um, uh, so the Department of Justice, from their point of view, is um, basically using the Olmstead, um, the, the Supreme 1999 Supreme Court Olmstead decision, which interpreted the Americans with Disabilities Act in a way that said that people should be um, uh, able to be in the most integrated setting possible, um, and that's according to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that is also that that principle is also being applied um, to segregated settings related to employment. Um, and so the Department of Justice um, is getting complaints and looking at different um, uh, employment settings in which people with uh, disabilities um, have in some cases been segregated um, and not having any opportunity for um, informed choice or opportunities to do anything else. Um, and so the Department of Justice is, is fairly aggressively um, upon using the Olmstead um, decision to, to, do, to go into states and do that, as they did in re most recently in, um, in Rhode Island um, and Virginia, I believe. Um, and uh, you can look at the Rhode Island case as a good example of the, what the Department of Justice is doing. Mm -hmm. So there's Senator Harkin. Uh, he was um, from Iowa. He's, he was the lead champion on, um, on the Workforce um, Innovation uh, and Investment Act. And he, um, uh, he really pushed really hard. And now he has, of course, been a, disability, a champion on many laws, including IDEA and uh, parts of the, um, the Rehabilitation Act and, and many, many iterations of the Workforce Investment Act um, and so on. And now he's retiring. Um, and, and so we will really, really miss him. Um, and uh, so we're trying to build new champions in disability policy and we need your help in, in doing that. So there he is at the signing. Um, so in addition to the, the reauthorization of Workforce Investment Act, like I said, some of the Rehabilitation Act rules are being updated, and we think this will really help too. So wherever the Dep Department of Labor can, they are trying to push um, you know, the needle again, pushing like federal contractors to uh, hire more people with, with uh, disabilities. Um, and we think some of the data that will be collected related to these new rules um, and some of the self-disclosure uh, will really help us uh, moving forward to, to understanding um, the real picture of employment for people with disabilities. Uh, so moving on, another um, important uh, law that was uh, reauthorized was the, the Combating Autism Act and some and there were a few improvements to the, to the uh, law as it was reauthorized. One was the new name. It's now called the Autism Collaboration, Accountability, Research, Education, and Support Act. Um, and uh, it reauthorizes the law for five years. Um, this law um, is put, uh, started in 2006 and put additional federal resources into um, some existing efforts to uh, help with the uh, high incidence of um, uh, autism that we're finding. So put a little bit more money into the Centers for Disease Control um, to do uh, more surveillance and um, research in this area. Uh, the Health Resources Services Administration to um, help uh, train interdisciplinary health professionals to be able to um, detect earlier um, and provide evidence-based uh, uh, services to um, children with um, autism. Um, and it reauthorizes the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee and makes some uh, changes to the committee to have more people with autism on the committee, more, pe more parents and, and more advocates. Um, it also designates a, an overall HHS official to oversee uh, the entire um, programs related to uh, the Combating Autism Act. 
So um, lots of questions about the home and community-based services rule. Um, I, basically, some of the here's just some of the key points is to make sure that I I think it I think it's just to make sure that the Medicaid home and community-based um, waivers or any anything related to home and community-based um, services under Medicaid should be home and community-based. I mean, it's really kind of um, that simple and. Uh, they were finding that there were some states that were using um, the waiver services um, in institution-like settings. Um, and there were a lot of complaints related to this. Um, and so I think that that's the basis for uh, writing the rule. There was a comment period and they got a lot of comments. Uh, we provided comments. Uh, they got hundreds, I know at least. Um, so they finally came out with the with the final rule. I think here's the key dates. It was published in January, um, effective m March 17th. Um, and now states have time to um, to transition into this uh, uh, into compliance with the new rule. So yes, it applies to settings in that, um, for example, you can't have um, an institution close but then set up little houses on the campus site anymore um, they that will be considered not home and community based if it's still institution like um, and they, and individuals living there do not have the opportunity to interact um, in the in, in the community um, and so there's actually laid out some pretty prescriptive um, descriptions of what the settings would look like and it also uh, affects um, provider controlled settings um, so that people have more self-determination um, and control over their own lives. So things like they should be able to choose their own roommates. They should be able to decorate their own rooms. Um, if there's, they should be able to lock their doors. <laughs> I mean, things that you and I take for granted or people without disabilities might take for granted there's a lot of people with disabilities who are very unhappy with the uh, lack of control in their own lives. And I hear it all the time when I'm with self-advocates. I have to go to bed at this time. I can't keep the lights on. I can't read at night. Um, um, so this is to try to resolve um, longstanding complaints with the way the waivers are being used. Um, will it apply to um, uh, employment um, if waivers are being used? in settings that are not, that are segregated, yes. Um, I believe that it will apply to any Medicaid waiver um, uh, service. Um, how I think, I think the, uh, I think the administration recognizes that there's going to be a long transition and that nobody wants to see people hurt. So um, there's, there's going to be lots of stakeholder input um, that's included in the regulation in the in the final rule. The opportunity for lots of stakeholder input into the transition plans and um, uh, every opportunity to make sure that um, people have um, input into the way it's the the transition plans go. Um, we are very uh, uh, we think this is. Uh, is very important um, in the way this is implemented so that people are um, uh, so that states are doing it in the right way and people are getting the right kind of services and people are having the right input so we put together with uh, some of our other developmental disabilities partners this HCBS advocacy site so that we can number one provide information about the rules so you can get the text of the rule of the of the regulation here you can get all the fact sheets that are, that are out you can get um, uh, you can see what other people are doing we invite um, folks to come and not just learn about the rule but also to share resources uh, we've been holding forums for our members um, to share information um, about uh, how to write the transition plans, what are other states doing, because I think states will, I think it'll be really important for states to learn from each other as they um, transition into uh, uh, compliance with this new rule.